Our text is Psalm 23, verse 2. He leadeth me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. As we saw last week, beloved, for a sheep, it makes all the difference in the world who your shepherd is. And David, in this psalm, is rejoicing in the fact that his shepherd is Jehovah. That is because, as we have seen, and as we will see further in this psalm, sheep are utterly dependent, foolish, naturally wayward, helpless creatures. Take away a sheep's shepherd and leave that sheep to fend for himself. And that sheep has a slim to none chance of survival. But give that sheep into the hand of a dependable, faithful, wise shepherd and all will be well with that sheep. And thus we have as foundational to the entire psalm, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The shepherd of David then is none other than Jehovah God himself, the eternal, unchangeable, utterly faithful God. He is the one who has eternally chosen David loved him freely, redeemed him at great cost, and promises always to care for him. And thus the conclusion has to be, I shall not want. I shall not want. I lack nothing. I shall lack nothing. I will continue forever to lack nothing. That summarizes the benefit the blessedness of belonging to Jehovah's flock. And sheep who belong to other shepherds, and from God's perspective those are goats, they lack everything. There really are only two possibilities. Either you are in the flock of Jehovah, or you belong to the devil who is the other possible shepherd. Although, of course, he is not a shepherd. He is a tyrant. He is a butcher. He neglects, brutalizes, and is cruel, and ultimately destroys his sheep. Now, the rest of the psalm is really a development which flows out of verse 1. Jehovah is the shepherd, the sheep therefore shall not want. And in what way exactly is it that Jehovah supplies the needs of his sheep? And exactly how is it, in what way is it, that these sheep lack nothing? And verse 2 begins with the essential thing for sheep. Green pastures and still Waters. And as we see in this verse, all of these things, green pastures and still waters and many other things besides, are perfectly provided by the shepherd. And thus this sheep, David, and we too, we can boast, boast in the right sense of the word, we can boast in the provision of our good shepherd in the care of Jehovah as we lie down in his pasture. Notice then, resting in Jehovah's pasture. Resting in Jehovah's pasture. First enjoying rest, then provided with pasture, and finally refreshed by water. Verse 2 really depicts for us a sheep at the pinnacle of contentment, lying down in a grassy meadow of rich pasturage supplied by a faithful shepherd. 
And in verse 2, the main idea on the forefront is not so much the green pastures, but rather it is the lying down in the green pastures. And this is something with which David, as a shepherd, who understands the behavior of sheep, was familiar. Notice in verse 2 that the sheep is not grazing. He is lying down. He has stretched himself out upon the ground. He is settled. He is relaxing after he has eaten his full. That's the idea. And that's only possible for a sheep who is in a state of calm. If a sheep is hungry, if a sheep is cold, if a sheep is tired or frightened or nervous or annoyed, it will not and it cannot lie down. And yet here we have the whole verse 2 breathes forth the whole idea of rest. Rest. The pastures are literally resting places. The activity of the sheep, if you may even call it activity, is quiet rest. And the waters are waters, literally, of rest. Consider for a moment the opposite of this sheep. A sheep who does not belong to Jehovah. A sheep, therefore, in constant state of anxiety and fear. A sheep not at rest. Such a sheep is not well fed. Such a sheep is wandering desperately over the hills and mountains, seeking for something to eat, because its empty stomach is gnawing with pain. Such a sheep is tormented by fears and anxiety, things from within and things from outside. Flies are annoying it. Other sheep are bullying it. Predators are threatening it. It feels no security at all because it does not have Jehovah as his shepherd. And that's misery for a sheep because a sheep is a naturally timid animal. The very snapping of a twig in the undergrowth is enough to cause a sheep to fall into panic and to run away. And so what we have here in verse 2 is as close as we possibly can get to describe paradise for a sheep. It would in fact be difficult to describe the happy lot of a sheep more beautifully than we have it in verse 2. I shall not want, verse 1 said, and now we have in verse 2 a sheep who is in the very opposite of a state of being in want. Here we have a sheep lying in the midst of abundance. Wherever this sheep looks, it sees tall, lush, thick grass. And he can graze to his heart's content. There is no fear of a food shortage in this pasture. No, quite the opposite. And now I haven't eaten his full. The sheep lies down, admires the pasture that the Lord has given unto him, admires this resting place where the shepherd has brought him. And there he lies, this sheep, without a care in the world, secure, happy, and at peace, chewing the cud, thinking about the goodness of the shepherd, rejoicing in the shepherd's care. That's the figure of verse 2. Put the things together. You've got peace and contentment and you've got a rich supply of food. You have, more importantly, the security and the peace to enjoy the food. Here we have leisurely grazing, delighting in one's food, lying down in green pastures. 
No complaint, therefore, comes from the mouth of this sheep. Because this sheep belongs to Jehovah. Jehovah cares for him. Abundantly provides for him. And this sheep rejoices in the care of his shepherd. Notice, as we will see throughout this psalm, everything depends upon the shepherd. Even the ability to lie down in the green pastures. For it says, he maketh me, or causes me, to lie down. Because sheep are naturally timid creatures, they rely upon the shepherd to reassure them that everything is well, so that they have the confidence to lie down. And it is the shepherd who brings their anxiety and fear to an end. Rest, calm repose, tranquility. These are the outstanding benefits given to the sheep of Jehovah, the sheep of Jesus Christ. Every sheep in the flock of Jehovah, whether it be an old sheep or a young sheep, a little lamb even, enjoys the rest that Jehovah gives. This, of course, is a spiritual rest. The rest of knowing God. The rest of having fellowship with God. A deep sense of well-being and peace. Knowing that God is at peace with us and we are at peace with with him in the covenant. And without this rest, beloved, all we can know as sinners, all we can know is the wrath and the hot displeasure of God. All we can know is a God who is at enmity with us and we with him, because by nature we hate him. And we know, of course, the Bible teaches us plainly that God is holy and that no wicked man will ever be able to have fellowship with him. And therefore, for the wicked, there is no peace. There is no fellowship. There is no lying down. There is a constant state of agitation and fear, a guilty conscience and the fearful looking for of judgment because we all know by experience that without the rest of Jehovah the Shepherd all we experience is the misery of sin we experience the misery of the guilt of our sin we know ourselves to be guilty and therefore to deserve punishment we know ourselves to be sinners by nature and by practice and we live in a daily dread of being punished by the Holy God. We know ourselves too to be polluted by our sins. We know our sins make us unclean in the sight of God, shameful and disgusting in the sight of God. And we know that if we are to reveal our sins, that God must destroy us, cannot look upon us in favour, but only in disgust. And then there is the terrible bondage of our sin. We know that sin controls us by nature. It has become our master. It has us firmly in its grip. We cannot escape it. We do not even by nature desire to escape it. We love it, and yet we need urgently to be delivered from all of these aspects of our sin. And when Jehovah the Good Shepherd makes us to lie down, as verse 2 puts it, he freely and graciously forgives or pardons our sins, and he assures us of that forgiveness. And knowing that, we can and we do lie down. We are at rest. We are at peace. 
knowing that God loves us and that we love him, that he is our friend and we are his servants and therefore we have peace. We have peace because we know that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, reconciled us to God. That God sent his Son to take upon himself all of our sins and thus to reconcile us to himself, to pay for our sins, to satisfy the justice of a holy and offended God. We know that the gospel tells us that and thus we can lie down knowing that. But more than that, the shepherd in causing us to lie down gives us an assurance of that. He causes us to know that our sins are forgiven. He causes us to rejoice in that forgiveness. That too is the work of the shepherd. Just as the shepherd is able to convince the sheep who are naturally timid that it is okay for them to lie down in the green pastures, removes from them all sense of fear because they have this profound sense of well-being in the presence of the shepherd, so does Jehovah God assure us of salvation. And without that assurance, we cannot lie down. It does us no good to know that there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ unless we know for certain that we personally have been forgiven by Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we toss and turn. We are worried and we are afraid. And we think to ourselves, am I really forgiven? Am I really one of these sheep? And will I continue to be one of these sheep? Will I be forgiven on the dreadful day of judgment? If I cannot know that, I cannot lie down. But the shepherd causes us to know for a certainty when we lie down, yes, he has forgiven my sins, even mine. Yes, I do belong to this good shepherd. Yes, I know he loves me and he cares for me and he will preserve me to the end. And knowing that, beloved, we lie down in the green pastures. This rest this ability to lie down comes only through the green pastures, only by feeding on the green pastures and drinking of the still waters. Without these green pastures, we have nowhere to lie down. Without these still waters, all we can know is restlessness, hunger, anxiety, and sorrow. Now these green pastures in the text are nothing but the best. And they are chosen by the shepherd with the greatest of care. Remember that number one priority for a sheep is food. If a sheep has no food, it will die. If we have no food, we will die. If we have no spiritual food, we will die spiritually. But not for those, beloved, who are in the flock of Jehovah. Those who can say with confidence, the Lord is my shepherd. Sheep, of course, eat plants. And they are also ruminants. A ruminant is an animal that chews the cud. And really, sheep are 
wonderfully designed by God. They have a digestive system which consists of a four-part stomach, or even four stomachs. And because of the natural bacteria in their various stomachs, they can digest food that we human beings are not able to digest, namely grass. And then they absorb these nutrients from the grass through their stomachs, and to get extra nutrients from that, they will regurgitate some of it and chew the cud to get more out of it. That's the way a sheep works. Notice what kind of pastures this good shepherd gives his sheep. Green pastures. Literally, green, tender grass. Tender grass, young grass, succulent vegetation, rich, juicy, nutritious pasture for sheep. Not a barren wasteland, not a dried up and withered field where there's hardly anything good to eat, but a rich meadow where everything is provided in abundance. Not a meadow where there's anything harmful, no noxious weeds or poisonous plants, but everything which is nutritious for hungry sheep. Now this pasture does not just come from nowhere. Green pastures, especially in Israel where David was a shepherd, did not simply pop up because it was a naturally dry and barren land. The shepherd, as we would expect from the entire psalm, the shepherd provides this too. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. If there is to be a green pasture in a barren hillside, the shepherd has much work to do. In fact, the shepherd has to become more like a farmer. He has to find it or he has to produce it himself. He does this by clearing away the rocks and the other obstacles and debris from the mountainside. He does this by seeding, by watering, irrigating, fertilizing the ground. And as a result of all of his efforts, there is this lush green meadow prepared for his sheep. Or he has to go forward and look for these natural green pastures. He needs to go ahead in advance, locate where the best pasture is for his sheep. He needs to check the area for all danger. He has to check, examine the vegetation. Is it the right kind of vegetation? Are there any poisonous plants there that would harm the sheep? Are there any dangerous predators prowling around that would frighten the sheep? Are there poachers who would try to steal the sheep? And then he has to bring the sheep to the green pasture and make sure that he makes them eat it. And the good shepherd knows that the best time for eating this green pasture is early in the morning when the ground is covered and thick with dew, water from heaven. And then the grass is extra succulent and juicy. But that means an early start for both the sheep and the shepherd. And even after having done all that work, prepared the green pasture, located the green pasture, checked that the green pasture is of the right kind, that there are no dangers in amongst this green pasture, the shepherd must also check that the sheep are doing what they're supposed to. Even in something as simple and commonplace as grazing, Sheep 
need to be under constant supervision because they are foolish, dependent creatures. Even give them a green pasture. They are not even guaranteed to eat the green pasture. And some of them will gorge themselves until they have painful bloating. Others will nibble the grass down to the bare roots so that it is impossible to grow back. Others will bully the weaker sheep so that they can't eat. And you have these sheep in the midst of abundance who are starving because of the bullying antics of the other sheep. Other sheep will simply be attracted to something along the wayside that looks interesting for them to eat and will ignore the green pasture that the shepherd has provided. Other sheep will not thrive because of an unbalanced diet. All of these things have to be taken into account by a good and a wise shepherd. If the sheep are to flourish even in the midst of a green pasture. So you can think of all the hard work and the care and the wisdom and the patience required of a shepherd just to get a sheep to eat. This is a figure, of course, we're not here speaking about the Lord giving us literal grass to eat, or even our physical food. He does give us our physical food. But here we're speaking about spiritual blessings and advantages. This is food for our souls. And as is often said, Jehovah makes me to lie down in the green pastures of his Word. That's what our soul will feed upon. And the figure, therefore, of the green pasture is the rich provision which God makes for us in the gospel. And what, beloved, a fitting figure this is. What a luscious meadow is to a hungry sheep, the Word of God is to us who are the sheep of Jehovah, the Word of God, the Bible, full of precious truths, glorious promises, sound, health-giving, nutritious doctrines, and sweet gospel. And how does the Lord give it to us? He gives it to us in the Bible, and especially He gives it to us in the preaching of the Word on the Lord's Day when we are led into the green pastures and when we hear the voice of the shepherd calling us to feed upon the green pastures we hear that from the pulpit and we hear that also in the catechism room ordinarily then Jehovah leads his sheep into these green pastures and along these still waters by his sheep being members of faithful churches where the gospel is clearly and faithfully preached. Remember too that sheep don't simply graze apart, but they graze together as a flock. And so it's right and proper that the sheep come together as a flock to feed upon the green pastures. And just as the shepherd has to have an awful lot of hard work and effort and care to make sure that the sheep eat, so the good shepherd puts an awful lot of effort, hard work and care into making sure that we have the green pastures of the word and that we feed upon those things and are nourished by them. The Bible did not simply drop out of heaven one day. It was a carefully planned book. It took centuries, centuries of God moving certain holy men to write down 
in his word so that eventually, after many, many centuries, we have the completed scriptures. And preachers too, who are called by God shepherds or under shepherds, they are gifts of the ascended Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 4 tells us. And those preachers don't simply drop out of heaven either. They are prepared over a long period of time. Often and usually they are prepared in the bosom of the church. Godly young men growing up in Christian homes, sanctified in godly families, encouraged by godly office bearers in the church, and then trained in faithful seminaries of God's Word. And then having set forth the Word of God, having prepared it for us, the Good Shepherd must ensure that we feed upon it because we are by nature attracted to all kinds of other foolish empty substitutes because we are foolish sheep we prefer oftentimes to feed upon the empty things of this world we neglect the quiet times that we ought to have with our Lord as we open the Bible for ourselves and we feed upon the Word of God. We neglect rightly to listen to the preaching of the Word or to pay attention in catechism. We neglect our family devotions and this way we think we can run on empty or we think we can fill ourselves with emptiness which comes from the world because we're foolish foolish sheep by nature <laughs> to make us lie down in these green pastures of his word is for God the good shepherd to apply that word to our hearts so that we are nourished spiritually by it and are comforted and assured through it. The Hebrew of verse 2 could be translated in two possible ways, either in pastures green or by means of pastures green. Either in the sphere of the Word of God in or by means of the Word of God by, we lie down. We, as it were, stretch out as well-fed sheep. We enjoy comfort and assurance. And thus this figure of a sheep lying down in green pastures is of a Christian who is in his or her element as he or she is in the Word of God. A Christian who has fed upon the Gospel, who delights in the gospel and it is now lying down comforted by the gospel and ruminating or chewing the cud as it were meditating on the doctrines and truths of god's word thus we read in psalm 1 verse 2 his delight is in the law of god and in his law doth he meditate day and night or job 23 verse 12 I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. That is the only way of assurance of salvation. Be in the word. Be in the word. If you want to lie down as a sheep, lie down in the green pastures under the care of Jehovah the Shepherd. If you want to have assurance of salvation, you don't lie down in a barren wilderness, you don't lie down in a field of thorns, you lie down in the green pastures of the Word. And thus you cannot be assured of your salvation. You cannot be comforted by the Word if you are separated from 
and deliberately avoid eating the green pastures of the world. And if there is a sheep in the flock who wanders away from the green pastures into a field of thorns or into a barren wilderness and thinks that he can survive there, we can be sure that the good shepherd will not allow that sheep to lie down. And if we wander away from the word of God, we can be sure of this too, that Christ will not make us to lie down. He will not allow us to rest. He will chastise us until we return to the word. That's, of course, what David himself experienced in Psalm 32, which we looked at a while back. The heavy hand of God was upon him. Why? Because he turned away from the word and walked in the way of disobedience. So do you want peace, contentment, joy, comfort, assurance of salvation, beloved? Do not seek it in the world. Don't seek it in worldly pleasure. You won't find it there. Don't seek it in new experiences. Don't seek it in sin. Seek it only in the Word. Which means practically, read the Word of God by yourself at home. Read the Word of God in your family devotions. Come regularly and faithfully to hear the Word of God preached from the pulpit. Come well prepared to catechism to hear the Word of God. Come as you are able to the other meetings of the church. We can discuss and learn about the Word of God with the other saints. And mix all of that hearing with faith. Believe the Word of God. And through believing the Word of God, you will have rest. As you believe in Jesus Christ, you will have rest from the guilt and from the shame and the pollution and the bondage and the terrible burden of sin which is ours by nature because we are sinners. We will be free then from anxiety and restlessness and fear. <clears throat> to complete the picture of the perfect rest of one of Jehovah's sheep, we have the still waters beside which the shepherd leads us. And just as grass pasture is very important for sheep, so of course is water. Especially so in Israel, which was a hot and dry place. Sheep do not require much water because much of their water comes from their food, especially if they get up early and graze on this grass which is drenched in dew, but they still need some water, and it is no small task to find water for them. Either the shepherd must go off looking for the water, must look for a source of good, clean water, or he needs to dig a well, which of course is very hard work digging a hole in the ground to get water for the sheep. But all of this effort is required in order to provide the basic necessities of life for helpless sheep. And this water is still water. Literally, waters of rest. We have the resting places of green pastures. We have the lying down in the green pastures. And now we have the waters of rest. Not a fast flowing river which would terrify the sheep by the roaring of the waters or even sweep them off to their death. Not that kind of water. 
nor a stagnant, dirty pool, a pool in which insects will breed, a pool in which parasites will thrive. That kind of water is unhealthy for the sheep. But fresh, sweet, refreshing, gently flowing water. Think of a babbling brook. That kind of water. Perfect water for a thirsty sheep who has just dined upon the succulent grass which the shepherd has provided. And as you come to expect, the sheep are not able to find the water for themselves. In fact, the sheep must be led to the water. He leadeth me beside the still waters. That is because sheep do not know where the good water is to be found. Sheep are easily deceived by substitutes. And so the shepherd must be vigilant, diligent, watchful that the water that his sheep drink is water that is good for them. To sheep, one pool of water looks much the same like any other pool of water. They do not seem to care that it is a muddy pool of water or that animals have trampled through it, or even urinated in it. In fact, as Ezekiel 34 says, sometimes the sheep will selfishly do that. They'll trample into the residue of the water and foul it with their feet, and then the sheep will still drink it. And how exasperating it must be for a shepherd who has gone to all of the effort to find a perfect source of water for a sheep to turn around and see his sheep drinking water from the muddy puddles. And that is what sheep do. Because sheep are stupid, foolish, wayward animals. And we are those sheep. When you see the foolishness of a sheep, you're looking into the mirror. You're seeing yourself. And this shepherd's leading the sheep is his walking before them to show them the way. That's not the way that shepherds lead sheep in this part of the world. They drive them forward, but back in biblical times, and even in those countries today, the shepherd walks in front of his sheep and reassures them that it's okay to come this way. As John 10 verse 4 says, He putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. And so carefully and gently and tenderly, the good shepherd leads his sheep. Here, my beloved sheep, this way. Here's the way of the green pasture. Here's the way of the still water. Simply follow me. I will show you the way. But what is this still water? What are these waters of rest? Well, water in the Bible as a figure means cleansing, means refreshment, uh, means life. And often waters in the Bible refer to God himself. The waters of life, living waters, fountain of living waters, these are God himself or they come forth from God himself and especially they refer to the Holy Spirit and the salvation that the Holy Spirit causes us to enjoy which refreshes our soul. Think for example of Jeremiah 2.13. God is the fountain of living waters. 
And there, Jeremiah accuses the people of being foolish because they have abandoned the fountain of living waters, which is their God, Jehovah, and have dug out for themselves broken cisterns where there is no water. Or Jesus, in John 4, speaking to the Samaritan woman, promises to her that this living water, which she will receive, will be in her a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Or John 7, Jesus says, Come unto me, ye who are thirsty, and drink. And says about the ones who believe in him, that rivers of water, rivers of living water, shall flow from their bellies. Or think of the last book in the Bible, the last chapter even, Revelation 22. Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, out of which a pure river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And then we have the blessed call of the Gospel. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And so we conclude that the shepherd leading us beside the still waters must refer to the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit, by means of the Word, causes us to experience the true refreshment of our souls that comes through the Gospel. And here we have, in this verse, two things. The green pastures referring to the Word of God, and the still waters referring to the Holy Spirit. And those two things, beloved, cannot be separated. The Spirit never works without the Word. Do not therefore expect that the Holy Spirit is going to whisper something into your ear and speak to you without the Word. The Holy Spirit does not do that. He will not give you private revelations from God. He will reveal to you what the Bible says and will apply that to your own heart. But he will not reveal to you something new and novel that is not contained in the scripture. It is also still waters. The Holy Spirit will not come in with a fanfare, as it were, with great ostentation. He will work quietly and peacefully. He applies that word of God to the soul of the believer. He brings Jesus Christ close to the heart of the believer as we meditate on the word of God. It's the gracious influence of the Holy Spirit who is now poured out in the New Testament that is this still water in our text. And beside that still water, the Good Shepherd leads us so that we may drink to our fill. We may have our hunger and our thirst for righteousness thoroughly quenched, and therefore we are satisfied. Put the whole verse together, and we have a beautiful, tranquil sea. Satisfied sheep, well fed and nourished, lacking nothing, everything provided for by the care and industry of the shepherd. And what a rich provision, beloved, God has made for us in the gospel of grace. Let us not be like foolish sheep who wander off looking for substitutes to the gospel who will find only harm and danger in the world. Let us rather lie down in the green pastures. Let us meditate day and night 
upon the Word of God. Let us drink deep at the fountain of life, which is the Holy Spirit. Then we will enjoy peace, comfort, assurance. Everything will come to us from our good shepherd, who is Jehovah, who in the person of his Son gave his life for us, that we might live abundantly with him, like the sheep, in verse 2. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we rejoice at the rich provision which thou hast made for us in the gospel. And we pray that thou wouldst give that not only to us, but to many who are outside of Jesus Christ today. But that will cause us to show that rich provision to others, that they might too, by thy grace, be attracted to this great shepherd, Jesus Christ. For Christ's sake, amen.